The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. going well for you this morning and I hope you're ready to hear and discuss more about this book The Ark and the Dove the answer the secret to understanding this is understanding Bible and history and this book The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives is the critical rare history book that unlocks the mystery behind the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. It's my privilege to read it on the broadcast. I hope you find it interesting and compelling, and I hope you be a regular listener. Now, for continuity purposes, I'm going to back up a paragraph from where we were yesterday. Remember, Lord Baltimore was seeking refuge in the colonies. And he landed in the Virginia colonies. And knowing that he was Catholic, the Virginians, who were Protestant, insisted that he take the oath of supremacy. And the oath of supremacy swore allegiance to the Protestant government of Great Britain that was in control of the colonies at the time. Now, Lord Baltimore would not swear such an oath. And so he refused, and he went back to England, and we'll read a little bit, talking about how they tried to compel him to swear oath to to the oath of supremacy, acknowledging Protestantism, and his refusal. It says, the acting governor of Virginia at this time was Dr. James Potts. Sir George Sandys had written a letter to a friend in London that the doctor, quote, kept company too much with his inferiors who hung upon him who hung upon him while his good liquor lasted unquote he was afterwards charged with abusing his powers by pardoning a culprit who had been convicted of willful murder in addition to this he was convicted of stealing some of his neighbor's cattle and sentenced to jail he was later released on pardon because he was the best physician in the colony and, quote-unquote, skilled in epidemicals. Although he loved his neighbor's cattle, he had very little love for his neighbors. He was extremely bitter against Catholics and determined that none of that faith should abide in Virginia. He was the first signer of a letter to the Privy Council setting forth the reasons why Lord Baltimore was not allowed to take the oath of allegiance in lieu of the oath of supremacy. So anxious was he to demonstrate to the authorities at home that he was a loyal churchman, that is, loyal to the Church of England, that is, Protestantism. Quote, we could not imagine, the letter states, that so much latitude was left us to decline from the prescribed form of strict, uh, uh, so strictly exacted, unquote. The letter then goes on to expiate on the Virginia idea of religious freedom. Okay, this is a quote that expounds upon the idea what Virginia regarded as religious freedom. Quote, among the many blessings and favors for which we are bound to bless God and which this colony has received from its most gracious majesty, 
There's none whereby it hath been made. There is none whereby it hath been made more happy than in the freedom of our religion, which we have enjoyed, and that no papists have been uh, supposed to settle their abode among us. The continuance whereof we most humbly implore from his most sacred majesty. So this is uh, a staunchly Protestant colony, Virginia. And they didn't want Lord Baltimore to settle there. Great animosity between Catholicism and the Protestantism, the so-called Protestantism that existed in Great Britain under the Church of England. Now this plea to the uh, the majesty in England lets us know that, that England was still in control of the colonies. And we understand from this book that, that Roman Catholicism was severely and brutally repressed in England because of so much Jesuit infiltration, subversion, and usurpation of the government, assassinations, gunpowder plots, uh, uh, Spanish armadas, the papacy did all it could to bring the, to bring England back to the Roman Catholic faith and to get control of that government and to save the Protestant faith and the rightful government of Great Britain. Brutal means were, were employed to put down Catholicism. And so both Protestants and Catholics sought refuge in the colonies. So we're simply having a shift of the conflict between uh, from from Great Britain to the United States. But Rome's taking a completely different strategy now. And that's what the, this book is going to uncover. Peaceful coexistence with Protestants. An, an attitude of non-provocation biding their time, little by little gaining power, little by little gaining control. And what we're seeing at this mature late date is the very threshold of Roman Catholic usurpation of the entire country and open government-sponsored religious persecution. That's where we are today. But this book explores the history, the genesis of what we're now seeing in completion in this country today. It's important for us to understand this information. Now he continues, he says, Baltimore, fully realizing that Virginia was no place for him or his colonists, made plans to return to England. But before his departure, he had to suffer a personal indignity. It's a matter of record that one Thomas Tyndall was pilloried for quote, for giving my Lord Baltimore the lie and threatening to knock him down, unquote. This punishment, however, was not meted out until Baltimore's departure and after Grover Harvey had arrived in Virginia. Governor, excuse me, Governor Harvey was a friend of Baltimore. Anticipating Harvey's early return to the colony, Baltimore left his wife and children at Jamestown, knowing that the governor would not suffer them to be treated unkindly. He expected to return to America and join his family in a new colony, which he hoped to be able to establish near Virginia. But finding that there were to be no hindrances and delays before he could obtain a new charter, he sent for them to return to England. The ship on which his wife and children sailed was lost in a storm at sea. Nearly all historians state that he lives, uh, that the lives, excuse me, the lives of the passengers were saved. The better evidence, however, is that they were lost with the ship. His son Cecil, the second Lord Baltimore, in a letter written several years later, stated that his father, finding that the cold of the winters in Avalon disagreed with his constitution, went from there to Virginia in the year 1629, where he found a much better climate and, quote, leaving his lady, his then second wife, and some of his children by her there, comes, her, comes himself to England to pro procure a patent of some part of that continent, and some, while after, and some while after sends for his lady, 
who, together with her children, who were left with her, when, were unfortunately cast away in their return. He, uh, unquote. Now, he continues, he says, After his return to England, Lord Baltimore took up his residence at Lincoln's Inn Fields. He kept his same residence until he died, and he would not have kept these lodgings and had his wife and children return in safety. Furthermore, there's no record of the death or burial of his second wife and the children by her. This can only be accounted for by the fact that she was lost at sea on a return from Virginia. In a letter of condolence to, to Wentworth, that is the Earl of Stafford, expressing sympathy for his friend's loss of his wife, he refers to his own personal affliction and to the, and to the loss of his wife and children. He wrote, quote, There are few perhaps, there are few perhaps can judge of it better than I, who have been a long time myself a man of sorrows. But all things, my lord, in this world, in this world pass away. Statum est, wife, children, honor, wealth, friends, and what else is dear to flesh and blood. They are but lent. They are but lent us till God please to call for them back again, that we may not esteem anything our own or set our hearts upon anything but him alone, who only remains forever. I beseech his almighty goodness to grant that your lordship may, for his sake, for his sake bear this great cross with meekness and patience, whose only son, our dear Lord and Savior, bore a greater for you, and to consider that this, these humiliations, though they may be very bitter, yet are they sovereign medicines ministered unto you by our heavenly physician to cure the sickness of our souls. Unquote. In the year 1630, Baltimore wrote another letter to Wentworth which reveals his spirit of tolerance. Writing on the occasion of the birth of a son to King Charles, he tells how the Spanish court, which had no reason whatever to rejoice over affairs concerning the English court and the Anglo-French queen, Henrietta Maria, did nonetheless rejoice exceedingly, and solemn masses and prayers were said for his, that is, the young prince's health and prosperity everywhere. Quote, Thus he adds, Your lordship sees that we papists want not charity toward you Protestants, whatsoever the less understanding part of the world think of us, unquote. This letter was written at a time of discouragement, after the failure of the colony in Avalon, after his rude reception in Virginia, and when the persecution of the Catholics was most bitter. Charity toward those of another religious faith was a rare thing in England of those days. There's no record of Lord Baltimore's second marriage, nor the birth of his children by his second wife. This is not at all surprising, but it has afforded the opportunity welcomed by a few historians to intimate that Baltimore was never married a second time, that the woman referred to as Lady Baltimore was his mistress, and that his children by her were illegitimate. If these same historians had cared anything for fairness or truth, by glancing at contemporary English history, they would have found no difficulty in explaining why so little is known of his second marriage and the birth of his children by his second wife. When he remarried, he was undoubtedly married to the Catholic faith, and probably the ceremony was performed by one of the Jesuit missionary priests. In England at this time, Catholic marriages had to be performed in secret in order to avoid Protestant marriage service, which was made compulsory. And, quote, women about to become mothers hid themselves in places where no one could find their child, uh, no one could take their child away from them to receive the dreaded baptism of heretics, that is, Protestants, unquote. His second marriage took place probably some five or six years after the death of his first wife and after he had made known his change of faith. The first record we have of his second wife is when he took her on his voyage to Newfoundland in 1628. In his letters, he refers frequently to his wife, and in a deed of trust to his son Cecil, under the date of March 20th, 1628, it is declared that, quote, 
For this purpose, Sir George Calvert and his wife Joan will levy a fine at Westminster on all the said lands, unquote. With his Catholic friend, Lord Arundel, Baltimore applied to the Attorney General in February of 1630 for a grant of land south of the James River within the boundaries of the province of Carolina, quote, to be peopled and planted by them with the permission to erect courts, unquote. Lord Arundel died in November of 1630, and the benefit, is co- uh, the benefit of his cooperation was lost. After the death of Arundel, a patent of territory extending southward from the James River as far as the Roanoke and reaching from the Atlantic westward to the mountains was granted to Lord Baltimore. But in the meantime, the Virginia colonists had set uh, commissioners to England to keep watch on Baltimore and see that he did not trespass on their preserves. So vigorous was the opposition of these commissioners, as well as that of several of the most influential members of the dissolved Virginia Company, that he decided to return the grant. Otherwise, he would have been the founder of the Carolinas. At the time he was meeting with the opposition of the Virginia commissioners, Baltimore found time to re-enter the domain of statecraft, but only to dissuade the king from taking up arms in the cause of his sister's husband, the disowned, or excuse me, the discrowned king of Bohemia, and thus becoming involved in the Thirty Years' War. Gustavus Adolphus had begun the invasion of Germany, and there was danger of England being drawn into the war. It was just prior to the era of the newspaper, Public opinion was expressed in tracts and pamphlets printed and circulated by their sponsors. Several vigorous pamphlets had appeared attacking the foreign policies of the king for not taking the part of the German Protestants. These were, quote, Tom Teltroth, or a free discourse touching the manners of the times, and Lamentations of the Kirk, and the practices of princes. Now, these are the titles of some of these, some of these tracks. Excuse me. Now, he says the first appeared when when Calvert was Secretary of State. He conceived it to be his duty to answer these attacks and uphold the policy of non-intervention. His tract, which was entitled "The Answer to to Tom Teltroth." The practice of princes and the lamentations of Kirk was intended only for private circulation and primarily for the guidance of Charles, to whom he felt a duty to explain his views. It was not published until after Baltimore's death and is interesting as revealing his views on religion and political questions of the day. A manuscript copy is in the records of the Maryland Historical Society. This is one of the few printed records of the writings of Lord Baltimore and reveals him as a man of peace, urging the king to avoid a policy that would bring upon his people the miseries of the Thirty Years' War. Charles took Baltimore's advice and followed his father's policy. Although he raised 6,000 men for Gustavus Adolphus, this was done in the name of the Marquis of Hamilton, and the neutrality of England was preserved. After Baltimore had refused to take the oath of supremacy at Jamestown, he went on a voyage up the Chesapeake in quest of unoccupied territory and beheld for the first time, and the first and only time, the meadowlands and hills of the future colony of Maryland. He had pleasant memories of this cruise and believed that the land he saw, quote, was fit to be the home of a happy people, unquote. After deciding to surrender to the Carolina Grant, he asked for a grant north of the unsettled portion of Virginia to include the lands he had seen on his cruise up the Chesapeake. The original grant included more than what is now included more than what is now known as the state of Maryland, as I call it Maryland, as I call it correctly Maryland, and it says the northern boundary was the 40th parallel of latitude. 
on the west of the boundary was the meridian line from this parallel to the most distant fountain of the Potomac, thence southeast by the right bank of the Potomac to the Chesapeake Bay, and thence northward by the Delaware Bay and River to the 40th parallel. It included all the present day of Delaware, a large tract now forming part of Pennsylvania, and a smaller tract now a part of West Virginia. The country beyond the Potomac was then un untenanted except by scattered Indian tribes. The Dutch were preparing to occupy this country, so the grant to Baltimore was one way of securing this territory for an English settlement. Now that the Virginia patents had been canceled, the king had ample power to serve a pro uh, to sever a province from the colony of Virginia to which he had at first assigned so vast a territory, and it was not difficult, says Bancroft, for Baltimore, a man of such moderation that all parties were taken with him, sincere in his character, disengaged from all interests and a favorite with the royal family to obtain a charter for domains in that happy clime, unquote. The first Lord Baltimore was destined to suffer the fate of Moses, for although he had beheld the promised land, he was never, quote, to set his foot thereon, unquote. Now we'll go on to chapter 7 of the book, The First Lord Baltimore and the Jesuits. A great change had come over the religious situation in Europe since Father Compton and Persons, since Fathers Compton and Persons first entered the English mission field. The Protestants had weakened their cause by useless controversy and senseless persecution, says the author. They had lost the effect of the death of their martyrs by making martyrs of the Church of Rome. They had attacked the, the union of state and church, but had neglected no opportunity to make political alliances or establish state churches else, uh, uh, excuse me, to establish state churches wherever and whenever they could. I'll stop now for the break and, uh, we'll return and continue our readings of the, uh, seventh chapter. The first Lord Baltimore and the Jesuits in the book. The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives to determine what was the genesis of what we now see maturing in this country. A pa total papal control. We'll be back. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately. 
and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Now back to the book, The Ark and the Dove, Chapter 7, The First Lord Baltimore and the Jesuits. It says, A great change had come over the religious situation in Europe since Fathers Compton and Persons first entered the English mission field. Remember, they were sent to minister to the persecuted Catholics in Britain. They were Roman Catholic Jesuit missionaries tending to the quote-unquote spiritual needs of those Catholic citizens who were being suppressed and persecuted in Great Britain. Now, this may seem sympathetic to the Catholics, and you have to to always remember that this book is a Roman Catholic book written by a Roman Catholic Catholic telling their story from a Catholic point of view. I do not endorse the Roman Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, I don't endorse the Church of England either, but it's important for us to know what Rome's attitude was about the colonies and what the colonists' strategies were when they founded their first Roman Catholic colony of Maryland and how that would form the basis of what we're now seeing Right this moment, the Roman Catholic gov- the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy taking control of our government, and now even taking control of uh, the healthcare industry. One fifth of the uh, of the American gross domestic product now in the control of this Jesuit controlled government. We're seeing the roots right here. This is basic history for us to understand why we're in the situation we're in today. So as apologetic as this book may seem to Roman Catholicism, it's not my intent to, you know, I'm afraid if people don't listen closely, they'll get the wrong idea. 
<clears throat> this is a study to explain what we're seeing taking place in this country today. So Persons and Campion, Jesuit priests, were sent to, Brit to Great Britain to minister to the, pre the oppressed and persecuted Catholics in, in Britain. And it says the Protestants had weakened their cause by useless controversy and senseless persecution. Remember the outrage when the word got out that there were Jesuit priests coming to England and uh, how violently the government reacted to those rumors. And uh, they weren't rumors at all. And why were they, why did the British government react so, uh, exuberantly to keep these Jesuits out because of the, the, the ruthlessness and persistence of the Jesuit order to bring Great Britain back under the heel of the papacy. So there was much controversy over these Jesuits coming, and it led to even greater persecution of Catholics in Great Britain. And many, many of you, even this author has mentioned that Campion and Persons uh, caused a great deal of suffering of the Catholics in Britain when it was discovered that they were coming over to uh, cross in the channel to come to England. And he says, they had lost the effect of the death of the martyrs by making martyrs of the Church of Rome. So there was killing of the Protestants, or excuse me, Protestants were killing Catholics. And that was destroying the the popularity, or at least the sympathy, of so many Protestants who had burned at the stake uh, during the dark Middle Ages, during the Inquisitions and the Crusades. And they began to kill Catholics in England. And he implies that that diminished uh, the sympathy for Protestant uh, uh, martyrs in previous history. He said they had had attacked the union of church and state, but had neglected the uh, but had neglected no opportunity to make political alliances and establish state churches wherever and wh whenever they could. The very abuses they decried, they adopted, and I'd have to agree. What Protestant Great Britain became was literally a mirror image of what Rome was. Now, the argument is, was it legitimate? I mean, do you answer evil for evil? But let nobody misunderstand, had not Great Britain protected herself with the utmost vigor, the Pope would have used, as he had already attempted, every means at his disposal to take control of Great Britain. So these are the consequences and uh, one can be on one side or the other about uh, whether England acted appropriately or not. <clears throat> but that's not the study. That's not the reason we're studying this book. And I've already made it clear what those reasons are, so I'll continue. It says, they finally awakened from their dream of a Protestant church universal to find a Protestant church divided against itself. Calvinists quarreled with Lutherans, and both persecuted diverse new sects with diverse new creeds, and consequently added to their growth and number. In England, the Puritans had broken from the established church, that's the Church of England, but in their, intolerant, in their intolerance found common ground with the more intolerant of the Anglicans in persecuting the Catholics, who with them had refused to conform to the state religion. So now you have you have even Protestant sects rebelling against the Church of England. Why? Because it was acting so much like the papacy. And it said, in the meantime, the Catholic Church had rallied the faithful behind the Council of Trent. Let me read that again. In the meantime, the Catholic Church had rallied the faithful behind the Council of Trent. That was the Counter-Reformation Council called by the Jesuit order to extirpate heresy. It damned every Protestant tenet. It damned Protestantism, Protestants, all they believed, and everything that resulted from the Protestant Reformation. 
I call it the bloody Council of Trent. So the Roman Catholic Church is stirring up the Catholics here, rallying behind this bloody council. And it says, the great work of the Counter-Reformation had begun. The vanguard of this movement was the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order, organized by its founder for the very purpose of combating the new schism and and winning back adherence to the ancient faith. So there you have out of the mouth of a Catholic exactly what the founding of the Jesuit order was all about. To combat this new schism. They call it a new schism. Why? Because there was an older schism. That's when the Eastern sect of the Roman Catholic Church severed its ties with the Vatican over a dispute over papal supremacy. They wouldn't submit to papal authority. And Catholic though they were, they broke away from Rome. They called themselves the East, the Eastern Orthodox Church and many other, many other sects of Orthodox. And now this new schism is called Protestantism. All right. This is what he's referring to. The founder, the founder of the Jesuit order and his Jesuit order were created for the purpose of combating and ultimately destroying this new schism known as Protestantism and winning back adherence to the ancient faith. There's your ecumenical movement, to winning back these Protestants back to the ancient faith of Roman Catholicism. Okay? All right. It was sending its missionaries far and wide, and there was no peril too great to hold them back from their endeavors and sacrifices. The deaths of their martyrs were, in the words of the poet Southwell, quote, the spring showers that watered the field of the church, unquote. As the Catholic cause was gaining strength on the continent, strength in turn was given to the little Jesuit mission in England. And as the years went by, recruits were being constantly added to the ranks of the mission priests, the Jesuit mission priests. It says the Order of Loyola, speaking of the Jesuit order, was making a strong appeal to the youth of England. Many were found to be ready and eager to risk their dire penalties imposed by the laws of their native land, that is Great Britain, by going to the novitiates in France and Belgium to be educated for membership in the, the, into the Jesuit order. During the reign of Elizabeth, all manner of laws were passed to prevent English students from attending Catholic colleges on the continent, that on, on mainland Europe. At one time, an act was passed whereby all students in the colleges and seminaries abroad were ordered to return within six months or else be regarded as traitors. The story of these young men who entered the order during the period of the Sicilian persecutions, remember Cecil was the one who was not so much religiously motivated as he was gaining back all the land that was previously controlled by the Pope and putting it back into British or Protestant production, it was the, con uh, the, con the uh, confiscation of Roman Catholic land and properties and, and all that and, put, and giving it to the Protestant uh, government of, of Britain and put it back into production, not for the Pope, but for the people of the island. Said the story of these young men who entered the order during the period of the Sicilian persecutions. It was Cecil who, who kept egging on the persecution of Catholics because that operation was the fountain of receiving all this Catholic property. So he was the instigator behind some of the viciousness and some of the great, the great scope of this Catholic persecution in uh, Britain, according to this author. The Sicilian persecutions, let me start over with, with the sentence now to make sure it makes sense to you. The story of these young men who entered the order during the period of the Sicilian persecutions and went through years of arduous training to prepare themselves for probable martyrdom and certain hardship, persecution, and peril, all the cause of all for the cause of religion, is one of the brightest chapters in the history of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order. 
the learning and scholarship of the Jesuits soon came to the front in the Counter-Reformation. They expounded the teachings of the schoolmen and applied them to existing conditions, thereby giving an impulse to liberal principles of government. Leakey says that the Jesuits, quote, saw what no others in the, in the Catholic Church seem to have perceived, that a great future was in store for the people, and they labored with zeal. They labored with a zeal that will secure for them everlasting honor to hasten and direct the emancipation, unquote. The Jesuit philosopher Suarez contended that the interests of the sovereign should at all times be subordinated to the interests of the people, and that civil sovereignty was through the natural law directly received from God by the people. The Jesuit Cardinal Bellarmine, in his famous De Controversis, held to a principle of government which will sound strangely familiar to American ears, quote, it depends on the consent of the people to decide whether kings or councils or other magistrates are to be established in authority over them, unquote. Now, this is unusual coming from a Jesuit cardinal, Bellarmine, putting the people in charge of the government. This runs contrary to Roman Catholic history. It runs contrary, to diametrically counter to all the teachings of canon law and the teachings of the Pope, the Pope insists that he is the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God, and he has authority over heaven and the earth and the underworld. He has all the prerogatives of deity. And he is to govern, he is to judge all men, and no man may judge him. He has the divine prerogative, according to him, to seat and unseat all kings. The kings of the earth serve at his pleasure. But here we have a, Ro a Jesuit Roman Catholic Cardinal Bellarmine writing this famous work, De Controversis, which held to a principle of government which will sound which which will sound strangely familiar to american ears quote it depends on the consent of the people to decide whether kings and consuls or magistrates are to be established in authority over them now now what's the deal why isn't this cardinal being excommunicated or brought to rome for punishment He's not talking about the, the, the supremacy of the papacy. He's talking about the supremacy of the people. That's not Catholicism. And his writings continue and become ba the basis of the attitude of the Catholics that are coming to this country. We'll continue the book now. It says, it was at the time... When George, when young George Calvert had a seat in the first parliament of James, that Bellarmine, the Jesuit Cardinal Bellarmine, challenged the doctrine invoked by the English king of the divine rights of kings and insisted that the people never so transfer their power to the king as not to retain habitual power in their own hands, unquote. Now still, you have to see how incredible this language is from this Pope. I have to back up and remind my listeners that over an unwillingness to grant Henry VIII a divorce, a Roman Catholic King Henry VIII sought a divorce. His wife, I think if my memory is correct, was barren and he needed an heir to the throne. And he wanted to marry Anne Bolin, and he wanted to divorce from his wife, and the Pope wouldn't grant it. Now remember, the, he's a Roman Catholic king in Britain, and he's been seated by the Pope, as all the kings of the earth, the Bible clearly says all the kings of the earth commit fornication. It says that great city, that Vatican city, that reigneth over the kings of the earth, 
that appoints kings and unseats kings at her pleasure. This Roman Catholic king sought a divorce from the Pope, and the Pope wouldn't grant it. And so Henry VIII rebelled against the papacy and took over the church and made himself a little pope. And he uh, superficially took on a Protestant attitude. But he was not so Protestant as to be well-versed in the Scriptures, and he maintained and held to this diabolical idea of the divine right of kings, which is the root and basis of the Pope's belief that by divine right he has the right to rule the world and to seat and unseat kings. So now we have Henry VIII having rebelled from the papacy, maintains to himself or arrogates to himself, independent of the papacy, a claim to the divine right to rule England. And this is the root of the heresy of the, the, the British church. What did Christ say? Christ is the head of the church, and we are all brethren. And so what Henry VIII did, in consistency with all of his Catholic training, he became a little pope unto himself, and he took over the church that used to be a Catholic church, and he called it the, the Church of England, and then began to persecute Catholics. As time went on, persecution of Catholics became brutal. So now we have a Jesuit cardinal named Bellarmine, one of the most famous Jesuit cardinals of Roman Catholic history, writing documents that sound so Protestant as to be immediately striking to our minds. A total departure from the belief and teaching of the papacy. And he's now asserting that the people, that the people are sovereign and that the government should, should serve at their pleasure. This is totally contrary to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Yet this influential Jesuit priest is sounding more Protestant than Catholic, certainly. And it says, James, making a great show of what he was pleased to call his learning, attempted to answer Bellarmine, but his wits were no match for the brilliant intellect of the Jesuit scholar, and his, and his writings were laughing stock in Europe. So this Jesuit priest is making mincemeat of the king in popularity and opinion. And it says, whether this controversy had any influence upon the future founding of Maryland can only, or Maryland, more correctly, can only be a matter of inference. But the significant fact remains that in the charter of his colony, Baltimore wrote in a clause that the law-making powers for the proprietary, excuse me, the law-making powers of the proprietary should be, quote, of and with the advice, consent, and approbation of the freemen. Unquote. Unheard of in the Roman Catholic Church. He said the proprietary should be of and with the advice, consent, and approbation of the freemen, the people. Sounds like our Constitution, doesn't it? Government of, by, and for the people. And he says there was to be no government in the colony of Maryland, Maryland, without the consent of the governed. Now, you'd simply just have to realize how contrary this attitude of this cardinal and the ideas that were tightly held at the time of the founding of Mary, the Maryland colony how contrary they were to the long-held teaching and belief and practice of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, these are Catholics who are going to establish a colony in this continent, in this country, that is going to champion religious liberty for all men, a government of, by, and for the people. And if you can't lock on 
to the huge contradiction that that is to the the consistent, persistent, forever teaching of the Vatican, then I'm afraid you're going to have a difficult time understanding the rest of this book. So you have to lock on to that. This new attitude that the Catholics are taking in this country runs diametrically opposed to the teachings of their own church. And it says, Father Henry Moore was one of the first fathers of the English mission and had a long period of activity in the mission field. He attempted to write a history of the mission during the last years of his life spent in the low countries. He confined himself to the records, and this was unfortunate as he was an eyewitness of many important events and happenings. He found many of the records, especially the annual letters missing, and he wrote little of the Maryland Project, although he had an active part in it. There was a dearth of Jesuit records from 1625 to 1633. These were important years in the formative period of the colony and, and included the years of Lord Baltimore, uh, excuse me, and included the years Lord Baltimore was preparing his charters and completing his colonial plans, but the curtain is drawn on much of what would have been of great historic in interest. Some of the missing records may be accounted for by the violence of the persecution at various times. A Jesuit chronicler soon after the Titus Oates plot writes, and we'll get to that quote tomorrow, leave you a little cliffhanger. Please tune in tomorrow, and then I'll continue where we left off in the book, The Ark and the Dove. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur's Cross the Border. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? 
What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.